In January 74, it rained and then it rained some more. The river's banks burst and the flood was the worst than ever there had been before. News flash people, it's been raining for five days and this time next week my city will be underwater. But as the river rose, the radio kept blasting out the mega hits. Let's go back to January 18, 1974 and try to find the higher ground. At 10, it's a holdover from our 14th of December 1973 charts, like Sister and Brother by The Drifters, coming to the end of a nine weeks in the top 10 of 19 in the whole top 40. Said it last time, and I'll say it this time, sometimes so-so just sells. Nine is an interesting cat and Charlie Rich, a guy who started out on Sun with Roy Orbison and Johnny Cash, and made a decent fist of the old rock and rollery before veering into country, where he became one of the most uh, reactionary voices and legend has it meanest drunks in Nashville. This came to a head on the night of the 1975 Country Music Association Awards when Rich got rolling drunk and, as the outgoing entertainer of the year, assumed the duty of announcing this year's winner. He began with, and the winner is, took the envelope out of his pocket and set fire to it. The audience tittered nervously while Rich gave up 20 seconds of dead air before uttering, my good friend, John Denver. Rich was banned from the awards for life. A young Tom Waits toured with Rich when he was just starting out and always spoke very highly of him. Rich was a superb pianist and always felt like he was a frustrated jazz musician. Late in his career he sobered up and actually did make a jazz album, which the notoriously fickle jazz critics all seemed to love. And the decidedly middle of the road beginning of the chart continues with Marie Osmond and her debut single Paper Roses. This record made Marie the youngest woman ever to have a number one country music hit at the tender age of 14. At number seven, it's our ghoulish old friend Bobby Boris Pickett with last year's Yuletide Tabletop of the Monster Mash. Now, last time this old favourite was a guest of the Pastors of Foreign Country, there was some mystery as to just how long it placed on the charts, along with like Sister and Brother and I and Pegasus. Now that uh, bugged me bad, so I did the hard yards and dug into it, and I think I can say that I've worked it out a little better. This one spent 17 weeks on the charts, three at number one and six in the top 10. Like Sister and Brother, as we said, not the 29 I reported last time, but a still presentable 19. And I Am Pegasus, not the ABBA busting 34 weeks as we had before, but an impressive still 24. Number six this week is the, at the time, highly controversial Summer the First Time. The story of a liaison between a 17-year-old Bobby Goldsborough and a 31-year-old woman. Controversial because in my home state it would only be played on certain radio stations after certain hours, lest it offend the censorious and morally wowserish government of the time. But also because there was 57 seconds of rippling piano and sound effects before the vocal came in, which meant it would never get the critical morning or drive time play that drove top 40 sales. Despite this, it did okay, holding out for 15 weeks for a top of number four. Nowadays, it's all over oldies, such as we have it in Easy Listening Radio here. What goes around, comes around. Now it's time for the segment that is the number one cause of juvenile delinquency in Iceland. Hello and goodbye. Where we hail fellow and well met to this week's new arrivals in the top ten and wave a tearful farewell to those who stood their duty. And the sole big entrant this week is Charlie Rich, who comes bombing in from 21 to 10, on his way, as we said, or maybe we didn't, I can't remember, to 5. Think of what might have set the public imagine so alight about it this week, unless people who didn't like John Denver thought my enemy's enemy is a friend of mine. Anyway, thankfully, former number one Helen Reddy's Leave Me Alone, which had the top spot for two whole weeks at the start of December, left the top 10 this week. The next number one record is yet to come, so hold your horses. Top week for three weeks, this time next week. Let's flip the disc and look at the trade-up, where I go looking for the records in the top 40 that never made the top 10 and probably deserved to. There's a few good ones this week. Most notable were old Bob Dylan, who's knocking on heaven's door, stiffed at 16. This week, it's on its way out at 31. Todd Rangan's Sweet Power Popper, Hello It's Me, debuted strongly at 35 this week, but only managed to limp to number 26. The other, lesser known entry is Looking Glass as catchy as hell Jimmy Loves Marianne, which I remember my nine-year-old brain thinking, this is going to be a number one for sure, but it only made number 14. What did my nine-year-old brain know? Listening to it now, the singer is a bit mumbly and maybe that cost it, but the horn arrangement still sounds sweet as a nut after all these years. 
Five is Elton John with the title track to his Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album. 1973-74 was the peak period for John's popularity here in Australia. I vividly recall I was staying at my grandparents' house on Bribie, which turned into an extended vacation because of the floods, and my older cousins, who were there at the time as well, made the long and bumpy trip into Caboolture to buy the album only to find out when they got it home that my grandparents didn't have a record player. So they prevailed upon the very nice lady who lived behind our house. She wasn't married and lived with her longtime friend who was another lady. I didn't figure that out for years. Well, I was nine years old at the time and not a very worldly child. They were famous because they used to have bulldogs and once they had a birthday party for their dogs and Women's Weekly came out and did a story on it anyway. We all sprawled out on the carpet with the lovely ocean view and played the album. The older cousins were very much impressed. I probably just played with the dogs. Well, the single never did make number one, stalling at three, but it's not surprising because this week's charts features a very large number of five songs that were one or another time holders of the number one spot, three of them for just a solitary week. Plunging back into the countdown, this time with reasonable certainty at four, it's at next week's number one, The Lord's Prayer by Sister Janet Mead. The record is just what it says on the wrapper. It's the Lord Prayer sung to a very contemporary rock arrangement with lots of twangy synths by a sister who wasn't a sister like Aretha Franklin is a sister, but an honest to God nun, a nun from Adelaide as it would happen. This is a pretty interesting record. It was a B-side for a start and got to number four on the US Billboard Hot 100, becoming the first Australian single to sell a million copies in the process. She cut an album too, that made the top 20. And what became of Sister Janet? That's none of your business. Well, strictly speaking, it was none of her business because she went back to the business of being a nun. She did work on a few projects later in life, but they were mainly limited release Christian projects. But probably even more important to her than being a nun at number one was her later work with helping the homeless, for which she was recognized as South Australian of the Year in 2004. And there was genuine sadness right across the community when she died in 2022. I'm so impressed by Sister Jan, I'm going to break a only once before broken rule and make her only the second person after Engelbert Humperdinck to be put in the Righteous Bojambo Hall of Fame by solely appearing in an episode of The Pastors of Foreign Country. That's a hard act to follow and follow it we must. And it's heartbeat, it's a love beat by the DeFranco family that does so coming in at number three. It'll be the record that knocks Sister Jan off number one after spending three weeks at number two, then another three weeks in that penultimate position, before it is in turn knocked off after a week by Farewell Auntie Jack, which is yet to debut. The DeFrancos were the pride of Port Colborne, Ontario, and according to Kent, this was the 44th biggest hit in the old hometown. By me, it is at most the 130th, about the same magnitude as Hello Goodbye. This means nothing, of course, but I can't remember thinking it was pretty grouse when I heard it on the radio back in 1973, 74. Yeah. It's time for number two, and it's another former one-week number one, 48 Crash by the fantastic Susie Quattro. Now, see Susie next year when she comes out. Susie's been to Australia so often, she's now spent more days on tour here than our current Prime Minister has spent in the country since he became Prime Minister all too long ago. Only ABBA had more number ones in the hometown in the 1970s, and Susie Q's three. Rod Stewart and Carpenter's also had three. Lyrically ridiculous, not quite so much as her magnificent can the can. Despite Susie's protests, this is glam rock in excelsior Dio. Written in part by a bloke from just up the road from me, Mike Chapman from Nambour, this is one of Susie's essential records. I just love the hell out of her. And I can't see a time when my day will not be made better by hearing and screaming along to one of her records. And the great Gatsby, the desperately deluded Gatsby, tells Nick, you can't repeat the past? Why, of course you can. Why bother, Daisy was never going to leave Tom. Screw you, Gatsby. We're not only going to repeat the past, we're going to improve it with Fowl's fantastic world of facts. It's Fowl's fantastic world of facts. Biggest rise of this week is Perry Como's For the Good Times, up 13 from 30 to 17 in only its second week. For all the huff and puff, though, the good times didn't last and it only got to number eight. Bummer. Biggest fall of this week is a song that I, as a glam rock tragic, simply adore. Barry Blues Dancing on a Saturday Night, down from 24 to 32 after a top of number two, denied by I Am Pegasus from its richly deserved glory. The highest debutante this week is way down at 35 with the aforementioned Hello It's Me by the impossibly multi-talented Todd Rundgren. And our longest chart denizen this week would be Let Me Be There by that bonza little Sheila from South Yarra, Olivia Newton-John. Another one that only made number two. 
in the USA, with the nation pondering the whereabouts of 18 and a half minutes of missing tape, the number one record was, spending a solitary week on top, The Joker by the Steve Miller Band. In the UK, it was still the mighty Slade with Merry Christmas Everybody, still decking the halls after a marathon five weeks. This time last year, it was a pre-funky Michael Jackson with a frankly horrid yet somehow unavoidable Ben, and in 1975, it was a similarly horrid You're My World by Daryl Braithwaite, who, as a king of pop in waiting, really should have known better. And the number one -iest album in town, come on, you can tell by the thumbnail, was Hot August Night by Neil Diamond. Diamond monopolised the number one spot for the next three months, both with Hot August Night and his Jonathan Livingston Seagull soundtrack, the album where possibly he started to take himself a little too seriously. This week we have records that spent a cumulative 11 weeks at number two without ever making number one, so I thought we might look at the biggest hits we've seen so far that never got any higher than number two. So far we've had 115 records that meet that criteria, and the 12th biggest hit amongst them was Beat It by Michael Jackson, which spent four weeks at number two in 1983, surrounded by serial number one spot hoggers, Total Eclipse of the Heart, Flashdance and Australiana, which between them spent 21 weeks at number one. Next is Love is a Battlefield, which spent two weeks in the posterior position behind that man Michael Jackson and his thriller in 1984. Skyhook spent five weeks trying to get to the top with Ego is Not a Dirty Word, as January by Pilot enjoyed a nine-week stranglehold on the top. Doctor and the TARDIS managed a high place despite a solitary week at number two, behind Robert Palmer's Simply Irresistible. Six weeks at number three may go some way to explain in the high ranking. Billy Joel parked We Didn't Start the Fire for four weeks at number two, behind Cher in 1989. Nice one, Billo. Amy Stewart never made number one with Knock on Wood, having to settle for a month as second best. Dutch group the George Baker Selection had a great 1975, putting Paloma Blanca in the top ten for an age, including three weeks at number two. The actual Beatles spent a singular week at number two with I Saw a Standing There, which did manage a long, long spell in the ten nonetheless. Our favourite hirsute Swedish knuckleheads Europe spent a month at number two with the final countdown. Chrissy Hine purred and slurred brass in pocket all the way up to number two for four weeks, throughout which they twice surrendered the spot only to come back, but they couldn't break split ends as invincible grip on the top. Celebrated dunderhead Michael Bolton's interminable How Am I Supposed to Live Without You bombarded the top spot for three weeks in 1990, but could not dislodge Sinead O'Connor's mighty Nothing Compared to You, one of the greatest number one hits of all time. And the song that by far spent the longest at number two without ever making number one is Phil Collins with his, well, I was going to say it was bland and wishy-washy, but then I just said Phil Collins, so that would be both a tautology and a pleonasm. His cover of A Groovy Kind of Love, which spent seven weeks sitting behind U2 and Bobby McFerrin. The only records to have spent that long or longer at number two are She Loves You by The Beatles, seven weeks at two and a week on top, similarly for SOS by ABBA, and two nine-weekers, Bohemian Rhapsody, which was knocked off number one and then spent nine weeks at number two behind Fernando, and You're the One That I Want, which spent nine weeks at number two and eight weeks at number one. Well, now that's out of the way, it's time to call on the crazy monk who's drunk on the Funk Girl Drummer Centre number one, Monty the Safety Monkey. And our number one this week is an actual Beatle himself, Mr. Ringo Starr, with Photograph. Not only the best drummer the perceptible Beatles ever had, but also the best drummer Rory Storm and the Hurricanes ever had. And Photograph is a great record, an absolute earworm from an album full of absolute earworms. Just one week on top, it got done by the nun, but it hung around in the top 10 for 11 weeks. I mean, this is maximum Ringo, as good as he'd get, but it's a stonking record, one he should be very proud of. Good one, Richie. And that, my adorable friends, is how the cow ate the cabbage this week, as the waters rose and calamity arrived to engulf my little town. It seems inappropriate to say if the good lords will and the creeks don't rise this week, 
because the creeks did indeed rise and 16 people died along with 8,000 homes destroyed. So, usual sign off notwithstanding, rest assured that we'll be back with a new instalment next week. Gish. This week, we have records that spend a cumulative... I can't say cumulative, can you? <laughs>